Welcome to Marshall Mindset, where we delve into some of the leading minds in business, martial arts, and academia to find out what truly makes success in any field of life. We are the fight coaches who will motivate and inspire you to level up your game, no matter how big or scary your goals may be. Welcome to another episode of Marshall Mindset. We're here with uh, Dustin Copel. Cobble, there we go. Yeah, I, <laughs> I adjust it right there. Uh, Dustin is a Krav Maga instructor, and we're very, very excited to talk about the fear of um, getting punched in the face. And this is for you, if you're, if you're a martial artist, if you want to become um, effective at defending yourself, you're going to love the content of this uh, episode. So st- stay, stay tuned. Stay. Oh my God, my English is still sleeping. You're How warming you up. That's what that is. That's all it is. <laughs> all right, hi guys, we're back again. So we're going to be following up with some great content. Today we are going to go through some, uh, some psychology, but we really want to talk about how do you do that practically in a street fight. So one of the things we're going to be looking at is how do you train to be punched in the face or how do you get used to the idea of being punched in the face and know better than us to ask a Krav Maga expert. So uh, Dustin, first of all, can you just give us a little bit of an intro about yourself tell everybody what you do and and uh how you train and and uh we'll take it from there yeah yeah so first off guys thank you uh, very much for having me on the show uh i love doing stuff like this and reaching out and just just spreading the knowledge so it's definitely a blessing to do this with you guys but uh my name like you guys said dustin koppel uh i started krav maga in early 2007 uh, it was in California at a Krav Maga Worldwide School, and they also did Muay Thai kickboxing there. So got the best of both worlds as far as that goes. A little bit later, uh, early 2008, started Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, just kind of had a blessing to have a job opportunity with an organization called Premier Martial Arts out in Knoxville, Tennessee. And definitely wanted to take it. Got to train with uh, some of the best people uh, you know, at their international training facility. And I was one of their head instructors out there and got to train with world-class martial artists for years up until 2013 when uh, I decided to open up my own school uh, not too far from Knoxville and uh, Oak Ridge and just kind of, uh, you know, got to got to do my own thing and been connected with a, a lot of great people as we, we continue to do this journey. So, you know, it's been a ton of fun. I've got to learn from some of the best instructors all over the world, and it's just been a fun journey. So as you guys know, martial arts, you have no idea where it's going to take you, but it's definitely a fun, fun journey. Yeah, I actually love the synchronicity because I, I started training Wing Chun in 2008, a year later than you. You started your uh, Krav Maga training, and I opened my school in Bucharest in 2013. So it's so funny. And also, I think you guys, you guys are Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu uh, nuts as well, so that's crazy. That's, that's yeah, nice. yes. yeah. Well, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is is like I don't know. It's it is fun. I mean, there's always a fraternity wherever you go. When we whenever we well, Bogdan, you know that whenever we interview guests and they come from different areas. And it's yeah, awesome. so it's like a fraternity. The, anyway, the funniest one was the Chuck O'Neill interview. You guys, yeah, you guys exactly. are talking about buying geese. <laughs> that we, I keep saying to him, I keep messaging him, you've got to bring your gi, you've got to bring your gi, bring your gi when you come to uh, see gi. So, uh, that's cool. My, uh, I, my most expensive gi is the, a $200 custom Ninja Turtle gi. So. <laughs> we need to oh, start yeah. a new podcast on geese because when we had oh, market, man. So all we were talking about was buying geese. We should, we should <laughs> get like an affiliate link for geese and promote. We need start, to. Start selling geese on, uh, on the show. We need to because we're really doing it. So talking about, getting back to the, the point really of, of, of the question, how would you, I mean, based on your experience, Dustin, how would you, what would be your initial thoughts on talking to students about dealing with the fear of being punched, first of all, rather than the, the actual training? So we'll start with the fear first and then we'll, we'll move on to how do you train for it? So first of all, how do you deal with the fear? What would you tell your students? Yeah, so, you know, if, if you think about any martial arts, they're going to teach you how not to get hit in the face. Uh, yeah, I mean, right. you know, no, nobody, nobody wants to get punched in the no, face. It's not. Not a, uh, it is not a fun thing, but, you know, there's so many MMA guys and so many uh, martial artists, they're going to tell you, like, you need to know what it's like to get punched in the face. Yeah. And, and, of course, in my opinion, when we're, when we're doing this and setting up training, we're not talking about, like, just getting bare knuckles and, and punching each other. you got to build up to it. 
Uh, so when we're doing this, what we want to do, of course, you know, you're teaching inside defense and stuff. You got to know what it's like to actually have a punch coming towards you because not a lot of people have ever been in a fight. They, they don't know what it's like. And, uh, you know, as people continue uh, to grow up, they're, they're starting to think about their families and how can we protect them. But in the same time, you know, not everyone's been in that, that high school brawl or the middle school, or whatever. And uh, they just, they don't know what it's like. So, uh, so a couple think, of things. I'll go sorry, ahead. Sorry, just to interrupt. So do you think, because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about what you're saying, and I talk about this quite often. Do you think it's better to start them bare knuckles or with gloves? Because this is often something. And then if so, yeah, if gloves that's, a, that's a great gloves question as well. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. So uh, something that we actually do is, is we start with a game called a uh, shoulder tag. Very, very popular. I and, love uh, that, yeah. Uh, you know, the, it's like you go to a certification, it's going to be one of the first things you do for a warm up. But if you really think about what's going on there and the, the psychology of that warm up, you're basically open hand and you're throwing very close to the face. You're trying to touch the shoulders. Mm -hmm. And so that is just you know, when you're, when you're doing inside defense that day or parries or picks or slips or whatever it is you're trying to teach, that is one of the best things in my opinion, because right off the bat, it's open hand, they're throwing fast. And of course they're not trying to hit to the face, but it's getting them ready and, and used to it because, mm -hmm. you know, you got to build people up. Uh, I'm not a big fan of just throwing someone in there and practicing it because, you know, what if they have PTSD? What if they've been beaten or something and, yeah. and mm -hmm. you know, they've been caught off yes. guard, but they're, yeah. they're there to learn. So after that initial step, you know, I would want to start them off slow and uh, kind of build it up. And you could go either way, in my opinion. Um, I, I prefer doing no gloves and, and Krav. Uh, but if they are sparring, then of course, they're going to wear gloves. But when they're first learning, you know, they're, they're starting off nice and easy. And, and sometimes I'll choreograph it and have them be like, hey, you're just going to throw left, right as they're working their inside defense and, and building them up in that way. Yeah. I, th I think we're all on the same page here. Like being teaching the um, street self-defense uh, martial art, it's natural for us to like, because most of the drills are going to do them empty hand. You're not going to wear your gloves to work or uh, on yeah, holiday. Exactly. Right? I don't know. I always say this, don't I? People in Wood Green walking around the high street with boxing gloves on. <laughs> That's one of the things. Yeah, you got to make it real. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> And like people, it's crazy in our, and at least in Wing Chun, in our uh, community, that uh, so many people train Wing Chun against Wing Chun. But people are not going to straight punch you in the face on, on the street, you know? They're going to go like exactly what you were saying, Dustin, You're like flurry of punches. So you need to get ready for that, I feel. Absolutely. Yeah, those crazy haymakers mm -hmm. that come from the pocket. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So generally then, would you say that, uh, you know, training with gloves isn't, a, I mean, look, I mean, when you look at most martial arts styles versus combat sports, people always go, well, look, if you want to learn how to defend yourself, you're better off doing some type of boxing. Uh, because the reason being, or the psychology or the mentality is that you've got live punches coming at you. You've got someone mm. that's throwing punches with gloves that's trying to hit you. I mean, do you think at some point in time that they should be that they should be building up to that? Or, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is, what's the difference in mentality if someone trains with gloves and, and uh, someone that doesn't? Yeah, so you know, it, it goes back to what is your ultimate goal of what you're trying to teach your students? In my personal opinion, because if my objective is to just teach them how to defend punches and we're not trying to build them up to be boxers but be able to react and and block that punch whether it's a, a straight punch or uh, a looping punch or haymakers hooks whatever we want to make sure that they're doing it realistically because with gloves you know there, there is added protection there and uh there's going to be a couple extra inches of velcros there they're not really feeling what it's like to go hand yeah. on hand yeah true then um you know, if, if I want them to do sparring a little bit later on, and that's kind of the, the curriculum that we follow because you need to make it more realistic, but in a safe manner. So, you know, we are going to do boxing drills. Uh, I'm not dogging boxing whatsoever because you could just be a straight up phenomenal boxer and have a great chance defending yourself in a fist fight. Uh, you know, but when weapons get involved, whole different story. So, you know, it's, it's just one of those things to where, if uh, it, it depends on the, the drills or what we're working on that day, in my opinion, if we're going to go bare knuckle or glove. So I'm not really opposed to just training either one. And I, I really prefer both of them. 
because, you know, if we are making contact and having them get hit, I want them to be safe. You know, I don't want my students to, to go bare knuckle and, and get caught. But at the same time, that stuff happens when you are trying to bare knuckle and you just got to prepare for it. But it, it's really uh, what are we trying to accomplish that day, whether it is, mm-hmm. hey, we're, we're going to work and, on some sparring stuff or whether we're just going and, and really focusing on the technique. And do you feel like um, sparring in, in that sense, like regular sparring, does that help with um, being at ease, being calm? If you ever need to defend yourself on the street, do you feel that that's helping them uh, deal with the fear? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so go back to talking about jujitsu. You know, uh, you're, in my opinion, jujitsu is one of the most realistic martial arts there is because you can go 100% and really just roll with your partner and, and work super fast. But, uh, you know, to make boxing realistic, to make that fight, the kickboxing Muay Thai, of course, you're going to put on gear because if we don't have gear, I mean, someone's going to get hurt if you're going 100%. Mm-hmm. Even with gear, you're not going to go 100%. But I'm literally trying to punch you in the face now. Uh, that, that's going to get you used to that. And, you know, if you look at the best fighters in the world, when they spar, if you watch them, if you watch them doing hard sparring, they have 16-ounce boxing gloves on, 14-ounce boxing gloves. When you watch them do slow and flow, then they're going to wear their MMA gloves, slow it down. But it's just they're, they're getting that timing right and the, the distance uh, a little bit different because mm-hmm. wearing MMA gloves versus boxing gloves while sparring is a huge, huge difference. Um, and it just, really messes with your psyche when you, when you have a smaller glove on when you're actually trying to punch someone. We'll just poke their eyes out as Wing Chun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I suck. <laughs> Just to take you back on the jiu-jitsu thing. So, I mean, because obviously everybody knows on this podcast I do jiu-jitsu as well. I mean, what do you think about punching and striking in jiu-jitsu? So when you're training your Brazilian jiu-jitsu, basically, do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, so uh, how Eddie Bravo kind of got the, the combat jiu-jitsu combat. really popular. That's actually, We actually love hosting that um, and having a few of those events because it, it really, really changes the dynamic of jiu-jitsu. Uh, you know, when those strikes are being involved, yeah. it really forces you to clean up your grips, your approach to what you're trying to accomplish. You know, you're going to change the submissions that you go for in a, in a, in a situation like that. Um, what I see when we actually host those events, a lot of people are going more so for uh, getting down really quick and going for some type of leg lock because they're getting their head really far away yeah. from the hands. Um, you know, so they're working heel hooks or knee bars, straight ankles, something like that. But it's just um, when you do incorporate that, and I think it's important to sometimes mix it up and allow your students in jujitsu to obviously not go 100%, but just kind of tap on the head and be like, hey, look, you're in a bad opportunity. So I think it's important as instructors to mix, uh, have a round or two, but not every single class, because uh, then you're taken away from the, the beauty of jujitsu. But every now and then throw it in there because it, it really changes how you're going to roll. Well, we, you know, have a heavy, we have a heavy component on it, actually, in striking and our jiu-jitsu. I mean, it's uh, – so if we're guard passing, we'll be striking when we're guard passing, basically, mm-hmm. because you've got to learn that, you know, it depends on what you're learning jiu-jitsu for. I mean, we teach Brazilian jiu-jitsu for self-defense. So we have less of a competitive emphasis on it. So therefore, if I'm passing the guard, I will be punching you in the face when I'm doing it. And you will sometimes find that when guys are uh, doing jiu-jitsu and they're trying to do a sweep and they're suddenly find they're getting punched in the face at the same time, you know, they panic a lot. They don't pull that sweep sweep off. You know, you soon start to find out what works and what doesn't work. So I think, you know, I've seen it with jiu-jitsu guys quite often that, uh, you know, you get accidentally punched in a roll and or accidentally elbowed or what have you, and they, they obviously they get the hump for it, but you know they they don't like it because it's just something that they're not used to doing it. So I really think it's important, especially if you're going to say, uh, yeah, I'm learning this to defend myself. Then you've mm-hmm. got to do, you have to do strikes. Yeah, yeah and, so, and so many people that that train jujitsu that are or that have jujitsu schools, you know, when a student's going into a school, they're not really knowing a whole lot, and you're saying, "Oh yeah, jujitsu is for self defense," but they're really teaching sport. Yeah, you're kind of, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. Baron Bola. Yeah, That's yeah, you're, you're like that rare five percent school, in my opinion. It's like ninety five percent is sport; the other five percent is, you know, uh, yeah. doing the, the old school jujitsu. You know what? This conversation actually reminds me of a video that I recently saw with uh, Master Wong. 
like uh, Wing Chun against uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Uh, yeah. yeah. It, there's okay. another video. He's um, uh, he's he's doing it with this uh, Jiu Jitsu black belt, and he's showing like what the uh, the Jiu Jitsu black belt would do in a self defense situation, and what he would do. And there's another guy. There's a third guy who's like the master who's uh, commenting on on the whole thing. And the conclusion was, if you're playing the other person's game, you're going to lose. So it's very good to have some kind of an understanding of what somebody else would do, what a striker would do in that situation, and what a jiu-jitsu yeah, I think so. um, expert would do if they took you to the ground, or if you're not careful and you end up um, uh, losing your position. Yeah, so I, f- I feel like we're, you know, as martial artists, we're, we're waking up to a lot more to the idea of, you know what, there's value in other martial arts style. Let me get something from that instead of just focusing on my own thing. Yeah, I mean, also people that are, well, I mean, I've met so many professional athletes that I've trained with, uh, trained with Olympians as well. Uh, I've trained with people that have represented the countries in many different sports, wrestling, kickboxing, MMA. Uh, you know, and they're always, always open-minded to ask you questions you know i go to them sometimes for training or what have you and they'll always say what you do and i'll tell them what i do or they know what i do or no anyway and they'll ask they'll say look you know can you show me something but when i did that uh, video with uh, john mcdermott john mcdermott's english heavyweight champion it's a big deal he's a top 10 you know uh, credited champion in in the country and when behind the scenes before the video you know, he said, oh, can you show me some, uh, after the video, she said, can you show me some stuff that might help? And I was like, what can I show you? You know, you're a heavyweight <laughs> champion. You know, you're the, you're, you're the boss at the end of the day. But this is, I haven't met a pro athlete that hasn't ever been open-minded. It's only usually when I get to YouTube and I, I read the comments on my videos and you'll get people saying, well, that wouldn't work or this is rubbish. And I just think, well, you know what? You just, you, that's the reason why you're not at a high level of what you do. Because Your bonsai you know, is wrong. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> you need to be open-minded to listen to other ideas to improve. But anyway, <laughs> that's why. Let's get back to the podcast. So talking about, so here's another question, very specific, Dustin. How, how do you teach people to deal with flinching? Because this is very specific. I know you mentioned the shoulder tap game earlier, which is a good idea. Have you got any other uh, suggestions that our viewers might might be able to work with? All right. So just to kind of talk about the, the flinch, in my opinion. So we all have a natural reaction off of something coming towards our face, whether that's freezing, whether that's pulling away, our hands come up, reaching for the target. You know, uh, if you really break down the psychology of what happens during that, uh, that scared moment, people are going to have different things. And so off of the flinch, it's actually, how do we build off of that? You know, if you think about bobbing and weaving, uh, if something's coming towards you, that would be the person who's kind of pulling their head away, right? Or slipping or pulling all that head movement. So sometimes that flinch that the person naturally has is what they're going to do, but we just want to fine tune it with the, the defense. You know, if hands are coming up, that may be a, a parry. It may be a cover. Uh, you know, the, the freeze that we don't want, the flinch that we don't want is the person that just goes completely stiff. And that is where, you know, you have to install something in them and then basically force it and just do drills. So like you were saying, the shoulder touch. Uh, another thing that you can do is where you, you take the boxing gloves and you, you very uh, light spar, like cat and mouse in a way, and, and you build them up. So one person's offense, the other one's defense, but it's very choreographed for beginners. And, you know, you have them practice these movements and in order to break a habit, you know, you got to train consecutively 21 days or or so is what they, what you do to build a good habit. But you, you just continue to train what you're working on and what you're trying to accomplish. So the, the flinch, in my opinion, can go either way. Uh, There are good flinches, but you, you just want to install a proper movement with them to get them in a better position whether that's bobbing and weaving slipping parries cover and advance uh 360 blocks whatever it is so i i and krav we just build off of that natural reaction off of their flinch yeah, sounds good it does sound like a, a great answer thing. basically the long story short is you just got to deal with the punches coming in yeah i mean 
you know, you got to do something. So you got to do something exactly. And I feel like also when you're not afraid to get punched, then you actually or, or sparring like that, you know what to do after getting punched. Because a lot of people, if if you've never got punched in the face before, you that's when you freeze. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh my god, I got punched. But it's actually you, you still have like a fraction of a second to react to do something until you feel the shock, the pain of uh, of getting punched. Yeah. 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 So we should really start to summarize what we've been, what we've said so far for everybody, just to sort of start to wrap it up basically. So generally you would say, uh, to deal with punching, is it to deal with a punch in a street fight, you need to have some sort of gentle training towards it. What what would we say? That was really how we started. Uh, You need a graduation from a mixture of barehanded fighting to gloved fighting. And again, with different types of gloves with drills. Is that a summary? Uh, Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to to start off, you know, you can't expect a a brand new, I'm talking about a brand new student. There's no way that you could take a brand new student and just go a hundred percent with them. I mean, it's like in jujitsu, you can't take a brand new student and expect them to, to just dive right into rolling without learning some type of basics. You know, you got you to build a student up. And that's the same thing. I mean, we, we start off small and then we gradually build them up. And like you were saying, graduation is, is key there, making sure that once they get past this point, then we go to this point and we really pick up the intensity. And then you start throwing fast, you start throwing hard, you start, you know, their eyes are closed, you push them and you don't know where the punch is coming from. I mean, then you really start to mix it up and, and build them up. And that, that's what we want in Krav. I mean, Krav is all about how crazy can you get with the drills and how chaotic, you know, flashing the lights on and off. The music's blaring and their eyes are closed and they just have to naturally react when they get pushed and, and see where the punch is coming from, what angle. And, you know, that's, that's definitely how you build them up. And that's like the end game that we want them. How long does it take them to get to that end game? Is it, are we talking months or weeks or years? So, I mean, in all honesty, every person is going to be different. Yeah. Uh, it, cool. It's just, you know, how, how athletic were they when they were a child? Do they have any coordination whatsoever? How are their reflexes? Uh, you know, I, I've seen students that could pick this up within a couple weeks. You know, it's, mm-hmm. uh, it, it's go back to jiu-jitsu again. You see people that can go right into rolling and understand it because they have natural athletic ability. Then you That's have people that... What's oh, like one, one success story of one of your students that you're really, really happy about? Um, so I have a, a kid who grew up playing basketball and, um, you know, he was athletic in that, that part. And, uh, you know, he got to the point to where he started thinking about, okay, I, you know, played basketball. He was a point guard. He was just kind of like, uh, you know, let me, what if I were to get into a fight kind of thing? And, um, uh, I mean, he, he dove right into to Muay Thai kickboxing. Uh, he did the Brazilian jiu-jitsu classes, and he did the Krav classes. He did all three of them. And, I mean, within, I mean, a couple weeks, it was like he's topping out some of the four-stripe blue belts. And, I mean, he was just getting really – he was really fast and agile. Uh, he was picking up the – and Krav, I mean, he was very sharp and being able to react, and his timing was great. His footwork was great. Uh, I believe – truly when a person comes from a sport that they've grown up playing and then mm-hmm. they translate into martial arts, I mean, they're going to do very, very well. Mm-hmm. 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 I agree. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So just to uh, close on that, did you want to add anything to that pod then? Uh, no, I'm happy with it. I'll send this to my students. And then I say, every time you get punched in the face, listen to this episode. Exactly. <laughs> important thing to take away though i think on the last thing that was said that dustin said was that you know and and i get this question posed to me all the time people say how long will it take me to be really good the the <laughs> answer is down to the individual basically you know as you said you've got a natural predisposition to yes. to uh, picking things up then you'll pick it up quickly if you don't then you know if you've been living on a couch for the last 20 years you can't expect to pick it up in the next few weeks it will take some time yeah. That's can i add uh, one more thing yeah sure Sure. Yeah, and, and, and truthfully, I mean, if I were to ask you guys, do all of you believe that you could defend a punch or react if a punch was coming at you? React. Well, we'll definitely have a reaction. It, it really depends on, uh, like, I think circumstance is also important. What am I doing? Am I eating mm-hmm. something? Am I looking? Uh, somebody Is somebody punching me, uh, like, from behind? Yeah. I don't know. To me, you know what changed 
a lot, like, because I was so angry before, I would get into a lot of fights. But ever since I calmed down and uh, became at, you know, just relaxed and uh, changed myself, I never had a, a situation where I needed to defend myself. It's so outside mm-hmm. of my reality right now. It's, it's crazy because I teach self-defense, but I never have people coming up to me to, uh, create, to start a fight. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> And uh, Mark, you want to add on real quick? Because I do want to say one thing after that. Oh, well, it's always situational specific. I mean, at the end yeah. of the day, we can train quite hard to deal with a punch. If I've got someone standing in front of me and I see the person building up for it, then yes. But, you know, the reality is that if I'm, and I say this quite a lot in my own videos, that if I'm uh, standing at a cash point, someone runs up behind me and punches, punches me and puts a baseball bat in the back of my head, which is yeah. We're ever going to have nothing you can do about that exactly that's, yeah. that's, that's really the point i was making so you know on the on the flip side i will not say that i could deal with every punch because if at the end of the day if someone's really going to have a go then they're going to choose the time the moment in which to attack and and if you're not prepared you know, you're pretty stuck so mm-hmm. uh, but you know if i've got the guy in front of me and i've got good situational awareness and i know what's happening and i've been in enough situations yeah you're going to see it yeah, you, I've got, I, at the very least, be able to get my hands to something, uh, even if to protect my own face. You're going to elbow the punch when it's coming. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know the, the key thing is I, always, I, I used to say to my students is, look, you know what? Someone might attack you in a street fight. Uh, and you know what? I would be really surprised if you got so beaten so badly that you ended up in hospital. Because at, at the very least, you should have... The basic skills to take a punch, not that I want to take a punch, absorb, deflect, get your hands up, you know, survive, even have the mentality or the mindset to survive and come back. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's unheard of that I've ever had any one of my guys in 35 years that I've been doing this you know, been hospitalized and beaten practically within an inch of their life. It just doesn't happen because they've got some basic skills of uh, at least taking a punch. I've had guys that have lost fights, but they've never been beaten so badly because, you know, they've got some sort of basic skills. So I guess what I'm trying to say is uh, I wouldn't expect to be, you know, put into a, into a real difficult situation. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and, and the cool thing about both of your guys' answers was, <clears throat> you know, you guys both understand the reality of self-defense, you know, um, one, one realm of it is not being there, you know, and the other realm is understanding that in a fight, you're going to get hit. You look at the world's best fighters, uh, even yeah. they can get hit in a fight. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but it, but it really boils down to if you want to build your confidence to know how to do it, you got to train. <laughs> yeah. Sure. There's nothing else. To it. And it's, it's all about the confidence. I mean, Knowing that, hey, I've done this hundreds and hundreds of times. I may, re- you know, be fifty percent worse out in the street, but at least I have a great fighting chance of it because mm-hmm. I'm used to it. And that's what we want. We want to condition ourselves to get used to it, and we want to condition ourselves how to completely avoid the situation and how to relax. I mean, that's a big part of it too. And I feel like there's a lot of people that don't discuss the soft part of self defense. You know, how to avoid it. Uh, and in my opinion, that's the best thing to do too. So, I mean, I that's, just wanted to hear your guys' mindsets as well, but you guys nailed the, you know, the, what? that's, and that's so. a great, that's a great topic for another episode. Like how to avoid being in a self-defense situation. Yeah. yeah the, the whole preemptive side of stuff, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, hats off to Ryan Hoover up in, um, I believe he's in Canada now, but he, he talks so much about preemptively defending because in self-defense, we always train from the negative. Yeah. You know, how can I train from the positive when I have that five foot gap? What can I do then? Uh, that's a big part of, a part of what we do as well. And, and, uh, Mark was hitting that on the head too, you know, being able to read the body and react before you get it. So. Awesome. It would have been, it would have been crazy for us, for both of us to say, yeah, no punch can touch me. <laughs> I was, I mean, yeah. At the end of the day, like, you guys have heard me say this all the time. You know, you, you've got to accept that you, when people come to me to learn self-defense, the first thing I say is, look, you're going to get punched in the face. There is no way that you can have a street fight and you're not going to get hit. You've just got to accept it, accept it and just get on with it really. Yeah. And that, that's the first you know, my advice in teaching people how to deal with punches, except that you're going to get hit. 
because the, the guy that doesn't accept that they're going to get hit is the one that's going to freeze and get completely shot. Oh, or, or worse, you're biting off more than you can chew because you think that nobody can hit you and then yes. you suddenly get punched in the face and you're like, what happened? I thought yeah, I was like, yeah. 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 <laughs> Guys, it's been great. I've really enjoyed it. So I think we've got some definitely. Good- uh, Dustin, let us know, let people know where can they uh, get in touch with you. Tell us a bit about the events that you're organizing. All right. So, um, so I know you guys reached out to Michael Hodge, who is uh, part of Global Martial Arts University. That is a, a very, very powerful thing that we've been doing where it's uh, learning stuff online. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, a, a lot of people will not train it online. But I've seen people from all over the world. It's really cool. Uh, I've got to work in person with people from South Africa, uh, Canada. I mean, all over the states here in the U.S. So it, it's really unique. But you see these students like evolve once they get the concept of Krav because Krav is simple. Uh, you know, we, we they do other styles as well. But uh, so global martial arts is, is totally a lot of fun. Uh, very, very unique for people to learn other styles. Like you guys were saying, you, you got to continue to learn and educate yourself in other styles. If you're just stuck on one, you're going to become closed minded. And uh, that's where I see all those negative comments that you guys were talking about earlier. Like you ask them, what style do you train in? They're most likely going to say one style. Um, <clears throat> the other thing too is uh, national martial arts. Uh, that is our, the name of our school. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple. Uh, Michael South is uh, out in Oklahoma City. He started it. And then I'm one of his uh, affiliates. We've been good friends for a long time. And then uh, National Top Roller is the, uh, the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu organization that we do. Uh, Southeast right now is where we do different shows and events. We, we host tournaments and super fights, combat jiu-jitsu, no gi. Gi, uh, starting to get into quintet stuff a little bit, like the five-on-five style matches and elimination mm-hmm. and whatnot. So just, uh, just, we're just trying to spread jiu-jitsu. So. That's but awesome. that, that's kind of – that's my life right there in a summary is uh, wrapped around those three – our, our school top roller and uh, global martial arts. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, where's the best place where people can get in touch with you in case they want to attend a tournament or, um, you know, a uh, competition? Um, yeah. Yeah. So if, uh, if anyone's ever wanting to compete, national top is mm-hmm. our website. You can check that out. And then, uh, you know, you guys can look me up, Dustin Koppel on Facebook. Uh, K-O-P-P-E-L is the last name of the spelling. Uh, I love reaching out to people and, and connecting with people or uh, Global Martial Arts University. Uh, you know, if you're ever wanting to learn Krav Maga, but don't have a bricks and mortar school that you can go to because there's not a ton of Krav instructors that are out there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so that was another thing. We're just trying to fill the gap. So Global Martial Arts University, I'll uh, work with you hands on. And I mean, you're actually going to talk to me. You know, I get messages. I'll answer them. Uh, I have like five tests that I got to grade today. And, you know, giving them video feedback and helping them out. So that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Guys, definitely get in touch with Dustin. Uh, we'll post links in the description and uh, let us know what, what was your favorite part about this interview. And, oh, and Dustin, what would be one question for everybody listening in that you want them to think about or answer? So repeat that question one more time. What would be one question that you have for our audience? Uh, one thing that, that I would like you guys to personally answer is your thoughts on dealing with the punch. I mean, let's talk about mm-hmm. this topic and, and let's hear what you guys have to say because I am a firm believer you can learn from everybody. Everyone's going to have a different point of view. Every instructor is going to say maybe one little thing that's going to click with someone else. And even if you're a student, you know, and you're just relaying what you've heard from your instructor, I mean, it may be a whole different uh, viewpoint. And, and I love just absolutely learning and and changing the way that I do stuff because, you know, uh, just because someone else does it different and it's not in the curriculum per se of Krav or Jiu Jitsu, uh, I mean, it may work and that's what's most important. So I'd love to just hear their thoughts on what would you do uh, or dealing with the punch and, and, and how do you react to it and your training methods. Awesome. Awesome. Guys, let us know in the comments. Okay. Uh, Mark, you want to add something? No, no. I'll just say bye from London. <laughs> Bye from Bucharest. All right. See you guys from Tennessee, <laughs> USA. <laughs> ah, cool. I love that you, you looked out the window just to remember. Like, where? where? Oh, yeah. I know. I'm like, wait, hold on. This is I'm so lost right now. Am I in? What world am I in? <laughs> awesome. Okay, guys. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.